Welcome to this next session. I'm Warrant Officer Steve Chersman. I'd like to introduce our panel for this morning. It's the first time we get all five Warrant Officers together. These are your Tier Charlie Command Warrant Officers. We have... Okay, we'll say six. Sorry about that. Apologies. <laughs> uh, we have, uh, to my left, we have Command Warrant Officer for uh, Fleet, Warrant Officer Andy Batonson, uh, Command Warrant Officer for Navy Capability, uh, Mark Henderson, Command Warrant Officer for People, Cheryl Collins, Command Warrant Officer for Training, Matt Hurley, we have Command Warrant Officer for Navy Engineering. Uh, got him wrong, sorry. Haven't seen him for a long time. Uh, Warrant Officer Chris Garner. And down the end, we have uh, Command Warrant Officer for a Submarine Group, which is uh, Warrant Officer uh, Chris Rowley. Okay, I'd like to introduce our first guest. We're going to try and roll through this as quick as we can so that we give you the opportunity for some questions at the end. Okay, over to uh, Warrant Officer Burke Thompson. Thanks. Click button, mate. 2021 has been a very busy and very successful year for the Australian fleet. Despite the challenges of COVID-19, we have delivered on every expectation of the Australian government. Here's a snapshot of some of the things we've been up to this year. Fellow shipmates, fellow mariners, fellow servicemen and our like-minded allies. First, I'd like to pay my respects to the traditional owners of this land, past and present, and those serving. 
I have the privilege of serving the Fleet Commander, Admiral Mark Hammond, and his, as his command warrant officer. And in watching this video, many of you will connect with these, act, these fleet activities, and I hope you feel pride in what you achieved. However, I know many of you who served in the fleet last year, or are still serving, will know that this video does not tell the full story, but rather just the effect of our maritime power. Indeed, as you walk these halls of this exhibition centre, you'll see many examples of the fleet in being. Our current sea power or the future capability of the Australian fleet. I could very well show you a slideshow of the great progress we're making in, in autonomous vehicles, missile firings, helos landing on decks, submarines submerging, and even the odd diver shot. But this is a sailors forum, and hence I think it's important to talk about the people issues in fleet. In my support to the Fleet Commander, I'm often listening to the many stories of what our personnel have been doing, their challenges when it's not gone right, but more often than not, what we have achieved through their service. The challenge of implementing our maritime power to achieve the government's strategic objectives of shape, deter and respond would seem at the start of a planning phase for each year difficult by itself to achieve. But when we overlay this with a pandemic, and alongside living in a country where Mother Nature does not play nice. Some may think it could be impossible. Hence, the video does not rightly show the human impact to the greater Navy team as we've been deployed both forward and domestically. It has come at a cost to the sustainability of the workforce and I do want to express in this forum that this is understood. In my short time that I have today, I want to deliver a couple of key points on the subject of respite and memories, and discuss what we have learned about the costs of the last couple of years and how we're seeking to improve. So what have we learned? We need to look at respite differently in our operation tempo, both as a collective but also at the individual level on how we monitor and measure a working year. Both need focus. On the collective, we have learned that respite is not simply a sleep outcome and chronic fatigue will occur through accumulation of effort of working too many consecutive days without breaking contact with a key stressor, and that is the ship. We're changing our use of language when we discuss respite with terms such as refresh when the port only delivers sleep, or respite when it delivers a break with a worker st stressor, or we step off, or reset when we haven't been able to deliver respite and we need to deal with the excessive excessive accumulation of days. Importantly, this is not to diminish the fact that if we need to, we can, and indeed we have, but rather to ensure that we work within a optimal level of effort. So if we are required to surge to a new task, we can do so at our best to achieve it both safely, but most importantly, with our most lethal effect. On the individual, we realise that having Navy personnel operating in the last two years and fulfilling domestic tasks has shown a real blind spot in how we record how much the individual is working during the year. This impedes us in our decision making on how we manage people at every level within fleet. Shortly, Fleet Command will reinforce the use of separated service data and use this data to manage individuals to thresholds. These thresholds are set to ensure sustainability of the workforce are going to be a major line of effort for the fleet within the retention campaign. My belief is that if we clean our data up and understand the true cost of a sailor's working year, it will drive a more efficient use of your separated working days, both in the way that we train, but importantly in the way that we operate. My final point is whilst fatigue has been a big talking point amongst the fleet as we walk the deck plates, there has also been the subject of having a generation of sailors who have not stepped into foreign ports. As we look to reconnect ourselves post-COVID or in our new normal, it is certainly part of the planning of the fleet to get to ports that we can step off and enjoy the unique opportunities that serving in the Navy delivers. And that's getting paid to see the world. Importantly for our allies in this room, the sustainability of our efforts in the Indo-Pacific will certainly be improved as we come more to your ports and visit and step off. Likewise, as you visit our ports more often and step off. 
Both the social, sporting and cultural aspects that we share together will build as like-minded sailors the mateship and respect that we need as we face together the security challenges of our region. It would also provide, importantly, the respite the Australian fleet needs to continue its mission. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks very much. Uh, we'll have our next uh, speaker. Thanks. We'll hold all questions until the end of all the presentations. Next speaker from uh, Navy Capability, Warren Officer Mark Henderson. Thanks very much. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'd also like to pay my uh, respects to the traditional custodians of this land that we meet today and also my respect to their elders, past, present and emerging. Uh, as just announced, I'm Warren Officer Mark Henderson and it's my privilege to provide you with an update of the future force in my role as the Command Warrant Officer in Navy Capability Division. Before providing this update, I feel it is important to summarise who Navy Capability Division is. Rear Admiral Peter Quinn leads the division and is the head of Navy Capability. He is responsible to the Chief of Navy for the achievement of Outcome 2 of Plan Polaris. Outcome 2 being the planning and delivery of our future maritime systems. We have already heard during a number of conversations this week and presentations that Australia's future capability requirements were identified in Defence's 2016 White Paper and updated in 2020 in the Defence Strategic Update and the Force Structure Plan. However, future capability is not fixed and requires constant review in order to ensure relevance. As articulated in Navy's Plan Makeda, Navy's capability is delivered through a programmatic approach. The five programs are Maritime Mine Warfare Patrol and Geospatial, Maritime Combat Support and Amphibious, Maritime Surface and Above Water Combat, Undersea Combat and Surveillance, and Maritime Command and Control, Communications, Computers, Cyber, Intelligence, Surveillance, Reconnaissance and Electronic Warfare otherwise known as MC5 ISREW. The more commonly known future capabilities of hunter-class frigates, nuclear-powered submarines and offshore patrol vessels have been well discussed. However, the scope of the future force is much more wider when we consider some of the more recent government announcements, including those in cyber, space, improved long-range strike weapons through Tomahawk and naval strike missiles, maritime mines, additional MHR-60 Romeo helicopters and the emerging field of robotic autonomous systems and artificial intelligence. The most recent announcement was just last Friday with government announcing Navy's partnering with Defence Industry for the delivery of extra-large autonomous underwater vehicles. In addition to these new capabilities, Navy Capability Division is also responsible for in-service enhancements to current capability and this includes the ongoing and planned upgrades to Anzac-class frigates, Hobart-class destroyers and Collins-class submarines, just to name the few. While there is clearly too much detail to provide in this short update that I have, I would like to draw your attention to four key capability considerations and I ask that you all think about these through the lens of how Navy is delivering the future force. The first of these is the pace of change. This is not only influenced by changes in the geopolitical and geostrategic environments, but also in the advancements of technology. To demonstrate this pace of change, by the end of 2024, which is only one posting cycle away, Navy will introduce new capabilities in mine warfare and survey, long range strike weapons and autonomous underwater vehicles. The second key point builds on the first, where the pace of change and new capabilities will require the Australian Defence Force, and in particular Navy, to think differently on how we might employ these new technologies. Thirdly, the introduction of new systems will drive change to how we train and employ our workforce. This will likely demand a more practical learning approach, one where emerging technology is introduced and we get on with using it as we continue to develop the operating profile and training systems. This emphasises the need for Navy to be agile and flexible in its approach moving forward for future force. The fourth and final key point describes three constraints to consider 
as we seek advantage through capability. These three constraints are physics, values, and the limits of our imagination. Prioritisation will be fundamental to address these constraints. Navy may need to consider reducing current readiness in some areas in order to bring online new capabilities. I would also emphasise that people and culture will also play a pivotal role in part to addressing this final point. In summary, Navy Capability Division is working very hard in the planning and delivery of Navy's future force. This is an exciting time whereby embracing emerging technology will ensure the Royal Australian Navy and the Australian Defence Force can contribute and lead within the Indo-Pacific region. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mark. Some really good points there on where we are as a Navy and where we need to be for the future and how we're going to operate as a Navy. Uh, I'd like to call our next uh, guest speaker, Warren Officer Cheryl Collins, Navy people. Thank you. All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, as just Steve just said, my name is Warren Officer Collins. I'm the current Warren Officer for Navy uh, People Branch. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to present today, and I no doubt have the presentation uh, that will generate some questions. Um, however, I hope to do is provide you with a level of information to clarify the intent of the Stay On Board People First, and leave you with a sense that we are listening and taking action, um, and that basically so your time in the Navy can feel valued. I've also brought my mod star with me, so uh, the lead for the Navy People Stay On Board, just in case we have any curly questions I can't answer, I will throw to him. All right, so why do, we, why do you think we need a, a retention campaign? So I'm just going to run through some facts. Um, so Navy workforce has grown from 13,898 in March 2018 to 15,430 as of the 3rd of March this year. Despite this growth, the Navy has not been able to significantly reduce the hollowness in our war fighting. So we can't deliver that pretty video um, with 1,500 people short um, in our key war fighting, basically, ranks and capability. So when you factor in the numbers within our training force, which is approximately 15% of our workforce, which are not trained, they cannot be provide unrestricted service, um, that leaves somewhere between 10,500 to 12,500 people to fill 14,359 positions. So those, those are not good numbers, and that's why you, you guys are feeling the pinch of the tactical level, and this puts more pressure on our deployable people to become redeployable uh, consistently. So recruiting is under significant pressure, particularly in the technical areas. Uh, the impact of COVID-19 record, record low unemployment and lack of skilled migration has seen applications to join the ADF fall by 41% in the last two years. This low attraction rate has impacts our ability to achieve recruiting targets, which are supposed to be growing by 20% per annum to drive the Navy to a 20,000 person Navy. So recruiting alone will not solve the Navy's personnel shortages, all the hollowness in those key ranks. This can only be done through retention and developing our people. This is why we need a retention campaign. Okay, has anybody seen this A3 sheet? Doesn't look really good on the slide, I don't expect you to read it, but I just want to show of hands how many people have actually seen this. Oh, hallelujah. That is really, really good. Um, that is excellent. Um, so, and for those who have actually read it and seen it, what's the importance or the significance of the workforce feedback and challenges column? Anybody? Second? Absolutely, it's your words. So these are exactly the words that have come into the retention team and they're put up there and then our retention team puts them into nice lines of effort, which I'll go through in a second. So they are your words, your concerns, your issues. So I think that's really, really important because traditionally in the past, we've, we've also sort of We've sort of changed those words a little bit to get to um, our level of speak, but it's actually what you are feeling, what you're experiencing, and what we want to get after and change. So the Stay On Board People First campaign was launched on the 20th of April. Uh, this is the first time a holistic approach has been taken to address the, the critical Navy workforce issues. Um, it consists of nine lines of effort that you can see, and I'll run through them very quickly so you get an understanding of, of where they are. Um, and the significant nature of the lines of effort, they all link up to a, a relevant two-star that is responsible. Um, and I think that sort of gives the importance that this is a whole of Navy effort. This isn't a Navy people space problem. This is a whole of Navy effort. So line of effort, uh, 
One is demand management, which is what uh, Bert sort of talked about in his, which is the fatigue, the respite, the management of all that, the work-life balance that everyone wants to achieve, the inability to complete training, watchkeeping routines, all those concerns that we have in our, in our core war fighting ranks, um, and they're the ones we've got to get after. So line of effort two, remuneration, which is also a very emotive and decisive, a divisive uh, function, but we understand there are stringent drivers for our people to leave the Navy. Sorry, we have recently executed an NCRP. Um, which is only one, one element of remuneration that we have the levers to pull. So I think that's a key message out of that. It's one element. So we're doing a GOPS, GOPS review, which is our constant, so increasing your wage on an annual basis versus uh, retention benefits, and a reform of pay scales. So this will be a continual long life thing rather than a retention benefit to sort of plug a hole. Um, so that's the importance of that. So individual development, so recognition of civilian qualifications, academic, and we had heard from John Blacksman this morning about how important academic and academia is on our education. So understand the impost of return of service obligations. I think all of us have had experienced one of those and don't necessarily like them, so we're looking into them. Um, and IMPS, uh, so investing great, in great opportunities for junior sailors um, to undertake external studies and aligning training to our capability requirements. Uh, leadership and culture. Um, so this one is a very emotive because uh, culture is probably the biggest driver of people to leave or stay in an organisation. So our people need to have a sense of purpose and serve and be valued as Navy members, social connectivity, participation in social events and develop a sense of camaraderie and a feeling of belonging and in a Navy inclusive culture. Wellbeing and lifestyle. So mentoring, the availability of healthcare services, misunderstanding of the modern family. Um, it's not mum, dad and two kids anymore, as we all experience. So I think we really need to get after that and understand what the modern family is and be adaptive to what that actually is. Line of six is member benefits. So quality of transit accommodation. Anyone been to Cerberus recently? Yeah. Yeah, it's awesome. Um, so really actually valuing our accommodation, so valuing our people and, and actually respecting that in the, in the conditions that they live in. Um, cost of transport. Childcare, housing, high cost cities, and all these things we're getting after. So greater awareness and education of the current benefits that are actually in existence um, is also part of that process. There's a lot of benefits in the Pac-Man that, if anyone has the time to read the Pac-Man, actually exist, um, and how to actually activate those. Um, also reshaping the workforce. The total workforce system is a key element in to bring in the activate those reserves. Once again, John Blackson talked about that. He's activating our entire. Uh, workforce. Um, that is too clunky at the moment and we need to get after that and fix that so we can activate our reserves and the transition in and out of our service is seamless. Um, next generation career management, realising the benefits from the whole workforce generation system, access flexible working arrangements and activate those CERCAT 6 simplifying the transfer. Um, and last is communication. So I was really pleased to see so many hands in the air because we've put a lot of communication out about this, but we are hit and miss and we need to get better at our communication from the senior levels down so you understand that we are listening, we do understand what's going on and we are taking action and that you should receive that back from us to say that your action has been, we've actually listened and we've done something about it. So each of these lines of effort, as I said before, falls in line with an area of responsible for a different two-star. This is not a Navy People Branch problem, but we've identified it, we've packaged it up, and we're taking the lead to push it out there, um, which, because we are the Navy People Branch, that's what we do. So just everyone get on board. Retention is everyone's effort, um, and I think we all need to get after it. And I think, it, obviously, there'll be lots of questions about this. Like I said, I have packaged my one-star over there, so we're good to go. Um, but that's all I've got for today. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks very much, Cheryl. Uh, great brief and, and good to see that uh, retention is a huge part of what we're focusing on for the Navy. I'd like to call up uh, next uh, guest speaker, Warren Officer Matt Hurley from uh, Navy Training Force. Thanks, Cheryl. Uh, good morning, distinguished guests, <clears throat> fellow mariners. Uh, as alluded to, I'm Matt Hurley. I'm the Command Warrant Officer Training Force. Plan and deliver is our strategic intent. Plan and deliver the right training to the right people in the right place at the right time to enable current and future Navy capability. And I'd like to thank Command Warren of Fleet Command for putting that video up because that's really a training force video because that video will not be achievable if we didn't have the right people trained at the right time at the right place. So Bert, thanks for the training force video. Well done, mate. Excellent. Um, I'd like to break that down a little bit more. Um, our delivery must be effective, efficient and engaging and time to enable the generation of current and future capability. Our content must be relevant and accurate. 
and we must have assurance it is fit for purpose. Our mariners must be focused and given every opportunity to advance towards professional mastery. We must have the right number of trained mariners to conduct sustained combat operations as part of the joint force. Our training is enabled through contemporary, high quality services meeting the changing needs of mariners, through a culture of innovation and continuous improvement, through blended learning and virtual opportunities. Commodore Training, Commodore Charles Huxtable, is responsible for managing and delivering Navy's individual and collective training, including all associated processes and planning, and this is conducted via seven training authorities and faculties. Aviation, engineering, initial training, leadership and management, maritime logistics and health, maritime warfare, safety seaworthiness, and it would be remit if I did not forget our submariners. Of our roughly 15,700 workforce, approximately 1,500 are uniformed staff, and in a steady state, we have just over 2,000 personnel conducting direct entry training and initial employment training. Those numbers include instruction provided by our joint faculties. In addition, we have another 1,000 personnel undertaking career advancement, platform systems and other proficiency training. While COVID-19 saw this number fall as low as 500, in a steady, it is steadily increased back to normal. 2020 and 2021 dealt Navy a vicious blow, but more so in training force, with a majority of courses cancelled, except our initial entry and it tested the resilience of everyone, especially personnel requiring trade and promotion courses. Now, if you're unaware, the definition of resilience is something that bounces back into shape or recovers quickly, which is where training force is right now. We've returned to normal ops. However, the only certainty is uncertainty. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Thanks very much. Uh, definitely the last two years has seen the challenges within training, but uh, it's nice to see that we're coming out the other side. Uh, I'd like to call our next uh, guest speaker, Chris Garner from Navy Engineering. Thanks, Chris. Thank you, Steve, and good morning. As indicated, my name is Chris Garner, and I'm the Command Morris for Navy Engineering, working for Admiral Chris, uh, Catherine Richards, who is our current head of Navy Engineering, and I'm proud to say the first female that has taken that role, as also Rachel Durbin, who's our Commodore, who's our DGN. So I'm very proud to say we have an engineering uh, division and branch in the Navy run by two excellent engineers who just happen to be females, and that's excellent at the moment, and we're trying to recruit uh, people into STEM. I'd also like to thank the First Nation people, the custodians of this land that we meet on, and their, their leaders past, present and emerging. I'd like to give you a wave top view of the four priorities that I see every day in my role, in my current role. Those are safety, championing FSU, the workforce and seaworthiness. As we are all aware as mariners, the maritime and ashore workplace contains many hazards that must be mitigated so far as reasonably practical. A significant part of this mitigation is a trained and risk aware workforce that has the mastery and ability to work professionally and safely, and to also confidently question procedures and call a halt to work that is not correct and safe. During community engagements, I've been asked how our safety record, particularly electrical safety, compares to other industries, navies and defence forces. I believe we must be careful with comparisons, noting the different contexts and situations. Yes, we must learn, consult with, and be aware of what our, our partners here are doing but we, mun we must run our own race. We must set our own goals. It doesn't matter if we are the best Navy in the world at safety, if our safety incidents are more than what we deem the minimum number. We must strive to meet our own goals and targets to ensure our people, platforms and the environment, the risks to the pla people, platforms and environment are reduced so far as reasonably practical and we meet our operational outcomes. The second point is being a champion of FSU. 
The Fleet Support Unit, or FSU, provides a planned and corrective maintenance capacity and capability to the fleet. In addition, FSU is working to be part of the Defence Logistic Network through the, position, to the, sorry, the provision of repair of repairables. A significant number of the RAN technical workforce works at FSU, and as a result, FSU has a fundamental role to play in the upskilling of these personnel. This upskilling is complemented with work on fleet units, industry outplacements, and secondments. FSU is working hard to be a supplier of choice for CASG and, all, and to also complement our many industry partners that some of us have all met today in the last couple of days. FSU has a display in the exhibition and I encourage you to pay a visit if you haven't already done so. The third point I would like to talk about is workforce and Warren Sir Collins has already covered some of my, my points but some of these points are worth repeating repeatedly. There are significant challenges with the technical workforce as there are with the whole Navy workforce. Unemployment is at record lows and COVID has affected skilled migration, as previously stated. As a result, we need to work hard to retain the personnel we have and recruit the people we need. The levers that we can pull with this have already been mentioned. Culture, being a great place to work. Also in the community engagements, personnel have indicated they're proud but tired and are still working safely and professionally to support the fleet and enable our capability. My fourth and final point is seaworthiness. To, to finish, I would like to highlight that all of us every day can meet, con contribute to seaworthiness. Regardless of where you work, your efforts support our fleet to conduct its assigned tasks. Cleaning your ship conducts contributes to seaworthiness, just as much as preparing a report for the sea release pro the framework program. The operating and support intent, or OSI, defines how we operate and support fleet units. Your work turns these concepts and the other elements of seaworthiness into reality. And I sincerely thank you for these efforts and the work that you, con you contribute towards seaworthiness. I thank you for your attention and I look forward to your questions later on. Thank you. Thanks very much, Chris. Uh, some really good points there on engineering. Uh, our last uh, speaker is uh, from uh, Navy Submarines, uh, Chris Rowley. Uh, thanks, Cheddar. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to briefly discuss submarines this morning. Uh, my name's Christopher Rowley. Um, I work for you, and um, I'm glad you're here to listen to me. I'm going to take us on a bit of a journey uh, through submarines. So who here was born after April 1994? Hands up. Good. There's a few of you. In April 1994, I was lucky to be on HMAS Ryan, and uh, we conducted a port visit to Adelaide. And as we sailed into Adelaide, uh, sailing out was uh, new ship Collins going out for sea trials. Very shiny, very new. So that was 1994. Uh, as we, uh, I was allowed to look through the periscope back then because we're on the surface, so I looked across the dockyard, and there was a few more submarines in construction. So um, away we went, did my port visit, did some more O-boat time, and then I went across to Collins boats. And those common boats are very effective and they're still going. But what we're going to do to them now is uh, we're going to do some uh, deep maintenance on them. And uh, you would have heard the term LOAT, life of type extension. So what we're going to do, I'm going to put those submarines back into um, the uh, maintenance facility in Adelaide and also remember the location, Adelaide. Uh, we're going to do some maintenance. Uh, we're going to get those submarines. We're going to make them um, as modern as we can for the next operating period. Uh, we'll get them back out to sea. We'll get them crewed. And they'll go out and do what we do in submarines. They'll be uh, stealthy, sneaky, and just do our thing uh, to help you out. Um, <clears throat> why we need to do that, um, no secret, you would have heard my chief vice admiral speak yesterday. Uh, we're getting new submarines, and those submarines are going to be nuclear powered. Uh, what does that mean for us as sailors? Currently, we've, um, we've started with our partners, and, and they've been very open, helpful and willing to take us on a journey. Uh, that willing, in fact, I've been lucky enough to go to sea on one. I've uh, sat in the first Sea Lord's office in the Ministry of Defence in the UK and been um, asked questions about it. It's not a place I thought uh, I would end up, but um, they're willing to come on the journey with us. And they're that invested that we went from announcement in September last year to uh, agreement at treaty level in February this year. So um, that's not something that happens every day. Um, it shows you how invested our partners are in us having success in, in the future. And, and where do we play into that? 
Um, as enlisted people, um, we make up 80% of the crew. So at the moment, we've already got some engineering types on high-end training in Australia. Uh, we've just had some people successfully pass their interview with uh, Admiral Caldwell, Naval Reactors himself, and we'll put some civilian engineers on some high-end training in the United States. Currently, there's already some uh, engineers, both Navy and Air Force, undertaking some high-end training within Australia. And uh, our first enlisted person will commence course next week in the United Kingdom. Uh, my fellow Warren Officer Alastair Hogarth, eight numbers away from me from when we joined up together. He's going to have a look at a course and, and we get there. So um, there's opportunity for us all. Uh, how do you get involved? Go to our website. Um, have a look. But more importantly, just be engaged. There is uh, both the CWOs from the current submarine force are, are in the building. I am here, even though I've done 12 months within the submarine force in 10 years, I still wear my dolphins with pride. Uh, reach out to us. Um, we have good comms products. Um, so um, be inquisitive. Come and find me. Ask me questions. Uh, I'll answer or I'll point you in the right direction. But, you know, this, this is an exciting future. Now, why ask you to remember Adelaide? If you like Adelaide, uh, we will be building or, and assembling our future submarine in Adelaide and we will need people there for long term. So it's a shameless plug for you to consider that as a location. Um, you've also seen the announcement that, um, noting that we're on the east coast of Australia, yeah, there is a plan for us to have an east coast base. So um, what we also need to be aware of, as this is a whole of nation enterprise, there will be people involved in this uh, future submarine world that necessarily don't wear dolphins. Like there'll be, there's many enablers to putting a nuclear powered submarine to sea. Like it's the pointy end of a system of systems of systems of systems. It's complex, it's big. There'll be some changes to what happens in our Navy, in our Defence Force, in our government about how we do this. But the one thing I can assure you, it's safe. The two nations who steward this current technology have not had an incident in seven years. And why they have not had an incident? Because they, um, they follow their principles. Look up Rick Over. Um, he is still quoted in the program. Um, it's attention to details. It's doing the little things right. It's having data. But generally, it's what we are. It's having good sailors behind it. So thank you for the opportunity to give you my quick pitch on all submarines, all things submarines. And um, I look forward to some questions. But I'm on the green tree. I do work in a funny building. Um, get hold of me. Um, if I can't find the answer, there's people in my building that will help me, uh, help me, help me, help you to make a decision to come to submarines. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chris. Exciting times ahead for uh, submarines. And uh, I'm a little bit lost for words because we've got uh, six warrant officers being given a mic and we've had six presentations in under 40 minutes. So that's outstanding. So, yes. Yes. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, that now uh, gives us 20 minutes for uh, questions from the floor. I'm sure there are plenty of questions. When you do uh, ask those questions, I just get you to, when you uh, pose the question, identify who it is that you'd uh, like to talk to about that. So I have uh, two people. Uh, Juan, thanks very much, Juan. Uh, and someone over this side with a mic. Very good, ready to go. So uh, over to the floor. Uh, leading really Seaman Saunders. Oh, sorry. Uh, just directing a question at you, Woe Collins. Uh, just in regards to my inquiry that I submitted a while ago into separation within the defence, uh, just so everyone on the floor knows, I believe that the culture within separation uh, and separating within the defence wasn't quite poor. People weren't getting acknowledged and appreciated how they should be for their careers within the defence. I felt there could be a better process involved and more knowledge put out there on how to separate. And then I felt as well that this could go back on retention and actually help save a few people from actually discharging. I just wanted to know, uh, ma'am, if you heard anything further on that process and where that was going. Is this yeah, sweet. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so thanks uh, for your letter. Uh, initially to start the conversation uh, with our three services. Sorry, I lean forward. Um, so part of that work, um, and, and led once again by DGMP, is how do we actually transition our people better with dignity and respect so we can actually activate that TWS and actually have people willingly to come back in. And part of that was the process of how we transition people, which was pretty um, poor, to be honest. 
Um, so part of that process, um, I went and spoke to ASPU, APSU, sorry, Army Personnel Support Unit, and had a look at how they actually transition their people out um, and the care that's given as part of the interview process and all that sort of stuff. So we're looking at uh, whether we can adapt that into shore force, into PSU units, so you get a little bit more uh, human interaction when you transition, and then three, six, eight months after. But also part of that transition is to actually have you part of a community, as in part of the reserve community, which is Captain Wendy Gould's space, getting after that. Um, so you, we just don't discharge you and then see you later. Part of that is also uh, what's a letter of appreciation, that uh, it's my intent to get CN to sign that. That will go to every, un every person that exits the Navy, thanking them for their service. Um, so it's a big body of work that we're getting after. It's a tri -serv It's now turned into a tri-service brief because they liked our ideas that much. It's now coming across Army and Air Force as well. So um, thank you for your letter once again because it did spark a conversation and it sparked a response um, because, like I said, I've, I've never transitioned, so I didn't know the process was so poor. Um, so thank you once again. And it's, it's actually sparked a body of work, which I'm happy to do, um, to make sure that we transition our people better and activate the TWS. So thanks again. Surely not. There's one in the middle. Oh, sorry, just here, in the middle, thanks. Test, test, no, I know, I just want to do that. <laughs> yeah, Warren Osman Hennick from Hutchmost Morton. Uh, Cheryl, for you and probably your, the uh, one star there, the Commodore. Um, just walking around on the floor the last couple of days, the amount of uh, people who have reached that age of 60 who are doing a magnificent job for prime contractors and others and the like. Um, I know CRA is 60 and higher for um, 63, I believe, still for higher ranks. Uh, is there any thought about the increase of CRA in the future? Um, to, you know, it's a young person's navy, I know, but you've got some magnificent people still doing jobs at the age of 60 who have had to move on. Um, like me. Yeah, if oh, you're <laughs> So are you asking for a job? Um, no, so absolutely. I mean, I think uh, part of the retention campaign, nothing's off the table. So it's definitely part of one of the lines of effort on the retention campaign is to look at CRA and see if it actually is contemporary. Um, so the short answer is it's always been there to actually apply to have it extended anyway. Um, but I think holistically we need to look at it. Absolutely. It's on part of the campaign, so it is getting looked at. Anything else to add? Did I miss anything, boss? No, no. Sweet. Cool. Great question. Thanks. Yep. So I'm CPO and I do for French Navy, French British after 20 years in the French submarine. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my question is for Sherry too. Uh, it's an early day. Uh, you have mentioned your first challenge is um, to grow uh, very quickly uh, the number of, uh, of uh, your sellers. Uh, the Royal Ocean Navy of the future are still on school benches. Um, my question is simple. Do you think uh, a tragic event as world between Ukraine and Russia has a, a positive or negative influence to attract uh, the youth uh, Australian uh, and to win your battle for the recruitment? So, so just to clarify, you think, you're asking me if I think war would entice people to come into the military? Is that what you're asking? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I honestly can't answer that. I, I don't know, because I think, I think service is a very personal and passionate thing that um, I'd like to think it, it creates, a, um, I guess, a feeling of national pride and people will come into the, the Defence Force. Um, that's my humble belief it would, because I certainly would if I wasn't already in. I would want to serve my country. Um, but I, I honestly can't answer that one, whether I think it would have um, a positive or negative influence. Um, I haven't really given it a lot of thought. So anybody else on the table? I would... Uh our culture is to lay back, um, but when we're asked to, we stand up. Um, and you, uh, this morning, the numbers that went to the First World War, the Second World War, the Vietnam War, uh, pretty much in the Australian spirit, I think if we needed to mobilise, the Australian public would mobilise. And what's important for us is to have the structure in place to mobilise into, and that's really what, what the, our defence needs to be prepared to do. Good question. So you got cut that in the middle. Thanks. Uh, apologies. This is for Will Collins again. Uh, this is just in regard to duty watch and the respite after doing duty. Is there going to be anything more concrete in place to allow sailors to have respite the next day or something along those lines? 
I actually might pass that one to Bert because this is part of the separated service um, stuff that they're getting after, which is we, we uh, that's part of uh, a big line of effort. So we, we have no data to sort of talk about any of that. So to make decisions based on, um, I guess, no cumulative data of our fatigue levels of our people is, is kind of not solving the holistic problem, but I'll pass to Bert to give context on that one. So what, what we have given command is a lot of levers to pull in the way that they manage fatigue. But what we don't have is a way to audit it and, and to give them thresholds to have an understanding about how much you should work in a working year. Um, we tried this in about 2014. Uh, we actually put some rules in place about thresholds, etc. We just didn't apply it. So fleet will apply it and that will mean that when you're duty, that day will be recorded. And then if it exceeds too much, then you will need to be provided respite and we'll put the mechanisms in to do that. I would still say that on a command or a ship, if I'm a sea while I'm looking for, has anyone uh, used to toil on a ship? Toil, you do a duty, you get the next day off. All those sort of mechanisms that allow the natural process of sustainability of, of the humans on the ship to occur. But definitely fleet is taking action on it and it'll be a line of effort for us. There's another question just here. Uh, Ma'am, so Leading Sam Russell from Recruit School. Bit of a joint question for Warren Officer Collins and Warren Officer Hurley. Um, what are we doing today, noting I've been at Recruit School for uh, two years now, I've seen the decline in recruitment. What are we actively doing today to try and boost that number? Because from a sailor there doing it and talking to the recruits coming through, sounds like they're getting absolutely nothing to try and bring them in, in terms of communication with Defence Force recruiting, Defence Force recruiting getting back to them, actively selling the job, they're sort of getting nothing. What are we doing to push that out to them? No, I've had enough. <laughs> uh, that, that, that point has been broached before and uh, we are working with Defence Force recruiting to, uh, to try and bolster the numbers. However, we're, we're competing with government at the moment uh, who are offering more money than what we can promise. So it, it's a double-edged sword, really. So we're, we're pushing hard with recruiting. You would have seen a lot of videos going on the TV at the moment. And it's, it's all about... We can't force people to join because that becomes conscription, uh, which sort of heads down the line of what our French car counterpart was talking about. We, we can just hope that the goodwill and people that want to look dressed smartly in the Navy uniform will actually come through the doors at recruiting. So, I would and, say, Matt, too, our best recruiters have always been us going out, giving stories, uh, you know, you're a dad at a, you know, looking after the kids playing cricket or whatever, and you, and you inspire people to join. We haven't been able to do that in the COVID years, and I, I personally think that's why we're having an impact on recruiting. Like, we're rebooting, we need to reconnect, and we need to get out again. What Fleet can do is go back to these ports all around Australia and show what it, how good it is to serve in the Navy, and that will bring people back in. So we have a, a big role in uniform to play in, re, in recruitment. Yeah. It's, it's personnel like yourself, Leader, that, that are the influence of the kids that come into recruit school, come into recruit school and see people like yourself standing tall and proud that then gets that message out. So uh, never put yourself down of, you know, that, that you think you've done a bad job at recruit school. No, highly the opposite. And, and I thank you for all your effort. Because I, I know you're heading back to the submarine world as the Warren Officer's just done his recruiting pitch, so well done. The other thing I'd add to it is um, people don't see what we do. So we do our stuff off, off the coast. Um, so, uh, you know, everyone sees the Army and Air Force, they're, they're, they're land landlocked in Australia. So what we do is actually external to that. So I think we had some really good ideas about how to engage the fleet. So every time a ship goes into a port, they should be doing an open day. We should have DFR on there. We should be selling our wares because we don't actually, once we leave the port, like we all do, we're 12 miles off the coast, no one actually is seeing what we're doing. So we need to promote what we do. Um, but also when we have the opportunity to have cocktail parties, open, out, open ships, we should be taking every opportunity we can um, to get people on to see what we do. Um, because, it, like I said, it's done on foreign shores normally in foreign waters. So, yeah, hopefully that answers your question. Had a question at the back there. 
Um, good afternoon. Good morning, Petty Officer Stratton. This is for uh, Warrant Officer Hurley or Warrant Officer Collins. Following on from recruiting, is there going to be a look into the way that we recruit people, i.e. via the aptitude testing? Uh, it's a very outdated way of recruiting people. For example, we had a sailor join with a PhD who wasn't accepted as a WEO because they didn't meet the aptitude. Having also come from ab initio training and the people that we have come in that are highly educated but don't get the jobs that they want purely because they're not meeting the aptitude mark and it's well documented that that is quite an outdated way of testing people to get them into the right jobs. Uh, yes, simply, yes. We're looking at all the processes. Um, we're constantly reviewing the contract with DFR and, the, and the basically the criteria to enter the military. That's constantly under review. Um, but they're also set by us. Um, so I guess that in mind, um, we are setting that level of aptitude, those gas marks for a reason, um, and DFR just apply them. So it's not necessarily DFR that are applying these aptitude tests, it's us. Um, so it's, it's our criteria that we set. Um, so that's a future Navy workforce sort of criteria problem. Um, and I can take that on notice to sort of inquire a little bit more about that. Okay, there's a question down here. But, yeah. Yeah, uh, Petty Officer Nielsen here. Uh, I've got a question, sir, for uh, Warrant Officer Hurley. Um, we we just spoke. Uh, you just spoke about things like um, courses, and I know the um, Warrant Officer Submarine spoke about sending people over to the UK. What safeguards do we have that those people aren't going to come back, do two years of service, and then uh, leave leave the Navy and and have a gap in that that knowledge? I'll tell you. Yeah. So. so um, that's life, right? We acknowledge life exists. I think the opposite, um, what I'm trying to work my way through as I imagine myself as someone else, is I go overseas, I meet a significant other, um, I start a family over there, um, I don't want to come back, but how can I stay in my enterprise? Or how can I thank you, but still keep you engaged, but maybe you're living in another country? Like, we really have to think our way through some of these problems in the future, because we'll be getting some bespoke skill sets at the start and um, maybe that's okay if you go overseas and never come back like as as a as uh, both Matt and Cheryl said like uh, the future is unknown to us but we just can't apply like 1980s thinking to it uh, and, and if you come back and decide it's not for you like we've got to be frank and have a pretty upfront discussion about why it's not now what, what did we miss or, or you know maybe you've changed and that's okay like I am definitely a different person to um younger Christopher. I'm a different person to 30-year-old Christopher. I'm a different person to 40-year-old Christopher. So that, that will happen to us all. But you know, we've got to be open to it. But it's making sure we do the best we can to support you while you're away on some intensive training and sea time to, to build our like skill set up in Australia. I'd also, I'd also just like to add, there's a, always a tension between training your people and they leave and not training them and they stay. So we have to consider, you know, to recruit and retain the right people, we have to give them training. We're going to lose some of them. But in some ways, it's a backhand compliment that our people are attractive to industry and they get recruited away. It doesn't help our numbers, but it proves that we're giving you world-class training that is worth investing in. Yeah, we, we, we don't underestimate how good a product we make. That's why we have some of the people downstairs handing out cards with, uh, what are you doing next? Call me, because I, I know what you've been made into through the the defence slash Navy training system. So never underestimate that what we are trying to, and when we, the, the Charlies here and, and the star ranked officers are trying to do for you. Um, some will go, but you know if we get the training right and then underneath that it's that culture and listening to you, we get that right, we'll convince you to do your initial contract, then look look at a second period of service. And that's that's the trick and that's, we're open to suggestions on better ways to do it. And we're all kind of stranded behind desks at the moment. OK, there's a question down the front. Oh, there, there you go. Uh, my question's for Warren Officer Collins again. Sorry, ma'am. Um, I just wanted to ask a question about contributing to the Australian uh, property inflation uh, targets, just about housing assistance. Um, so we have a current rental assistance model now. And I'd be just interested if that could extend to home ownership as well. Um, say for a member that wanted to purchase a house in a locality, I understand we have short posting cycles. Could, could RA be reviewed to um, have the allotted money or a part, portion thereof 
uh, for people that do own homes? Yeah, I think, I think absolutely great question. This comes up quite a lot. Um, and because, um, simplistically, the Navy campaign, we have um, certain levers we can pull. So the R2, uh, so the Recruiting and Retention Tiger Team that's been stood up. So we've sort of passed all these great ideas that um, effectively DHA is holistic, so it's all defence. Um, so we've passed that to the, the two the two two-star led Tiger team to take on board to do. Um, but I know um, the service warrant officers sit on um, a DHA board and they're constantly bringing up all the concerns that you guys raise with regards to RA, home ownership and all these sorts of things. They're constantly being raised um, and, you, you, and basically even changing simple things like when the incre increment goes up. Um, so we've modified that. So it's actually more in line with our posting cycle. So there's a lots of stuff going on in that space to try and make um, housing more accessible, but I do agree that um, I think home ownership is is where we want rather than RA. Um, I think that's definitely where. But once again, that's that's a holistic Navy, uh, sorry, defence thing. So we've sent that up to the Tiger team. Uh, down the front, thanks. Yeah. Good morning. Warrant Officer Mahmoud from Jordan. Uh, actually, I have two questions. One for uh, Warrant Officer Collins, and the other one for Chief Harley. The first one is uh, for uh, Mrs. Uh, Warrant Officer Collins. What is the mechanism for recruiting your sailors here in the Australian Navy? The mechanism? Yeah. How do you pick up your recruits or the sailors? Uh, the question for Chief Warrant Officer Hurley is what you are doing after recruiting sailors, the initial training, what you are going to do for the sailors to be an a sailor on board the ships? Thank you. Okay. Um, so uh, we have a what's called a, a defence recruiting organisation. So it's uh, contracted out, um, manned by military personnel. They go through a bunch of rigorous testing that, once again, we assign to uh, Defence Force Recruiting. Uh, and then they come in as ab initio and then we basically hand them to training force for them to put them through their initial training. Um, so, and that's everything from officer, gap year, every, every sort of stream goes through that sort of process. Um, it is contracted, however, but we do have military facing people in those organisations. Hello, Mark, good. Um, mate, in, so, so once, once we have those personnel recruited from the street, uh, they, whether they join as a sailor, they'll carry out nine weeks of basic training at our recruit school, and or uh, if they join as an officer, uh, they carry out six months of officer training. Uh, on completion of their, depending on which job they are streamed for, they'll go and conduct that training, initial employment training, uh, and then, then we get them out to the fleet as fast as we can to continue on their training. You're welcome. There was a question just here. There you go. I, Simon Fitzgerald from Defence Force Recruiting, funny enough. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we are working very hard in a very tra challenging environment over the last two years. Uh, we're trying to come up with better ways of doing things and we're trying to make the uh, process of recruiting a lot more flexible. So we are looking at a lot of uh, great initiatives to open the gateway past the um, online acceptance test and those types of things and um, having flexible education. My question uh, is to Warren Officer Hurley or Warren Officer Collins. Sorry, you guys are getting uh, all the questions today. Uh, in regards to enticing people to come into the Navy, what would be the appetite uh, in the Navy for a reserve force of, of about uh, 40 or 50,000 people that would uh, lead into that respite that some people have been talking about? And um, how would that be managed? Um, yeah, oh, absolutely, Mark. Crack at it. Uh, All right, I'll give, Navy people. I'll give Cheryl a break. Um, I spent the last two years in, in Cheryl's job, CEO Navy people. Um, I think to the heart of your matter, why wouldn't we say that we want to have that level of uh, assurance in a workforce? Um, one of the focuses that DGMP has been uh, introduced uh, about 18 months ago was uh, he has a, a captain, 06 level, who is the director of the Total Workforce System, uh, Captain Wendy Gould, and she is absolutely looking at how best to maximise. And one of those initiatives at the moment is these regional reserve teams or regional reserves units. And the idea behind that is that we actually maximise how we uh, retain, attract and, and recruit a reserve workforce, uh, regionally based or locality based, 
that uh, the permanent force can draw upon to be able to, um, as you say, use them more flexibly and uh, be agile in how we uh, can move and provide that respite. That would be great in the future and it's the pathway of how we get there that's going to be the challenge. But I know that there's a lot of good people working behind the scenes to try and get this up and running and, and hopefully the future looks bright in that space, if that answers your question. Got one question down here, thanks. Yeah, uh, one off Stephen Vaughan Ave again. Um, I'm going to throw it out that it's a question for. <laughs> one off it's not. I'm going to stand for two seconds. Um, the questions from the audience have been really good in the people space. And I suppose just to give you a little bit of reassurance from the Royal Navy, I would have faced every single question like that if I'd had a, a gaggle of my sailors in front of me. So we've got to catch up uh, with, your, with your one star and my boss in the next 24 hours. We're now hooked in. We are facing exactly the same situations and challenges that you are. And I can probably speak for that out of every single senior enlisted on the front row. So your questions are good, they're valid, and we are in the same space. So as we come out of the COVID pandemic for the last couple of years, business as usual for our around the world challenges, is you can be rest assured that the warrant officers and the senior enlisted uh, from around the world are linked in together. The submarine question, with regards to people going over, I've got the same question, I've got the same challenge. My submarine base is in Scotland. It rains 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. And now there's going to be the option for some of my submariners to come to Australia. Um, you do the maths on that one. I've got a bigger challenge than what you have. Um, I'm going to throw it out there. Um, just, just, so just to and I didn't even crack a cricket joke. But just to just take, no, no. Uh, so just to say, we, we have got the same spaces and the same challenges and all that. So the challenge from my position, and whether one of the Collins appreciates it, just keep challenging the system. Keep firing in the questions, because people are the greatest asset, okay? So well done, everybody, and sorry for stealing the thunder. Right. <laughs> okay, that finishes our questions. What I'd like to do now is uh, hand over to uh, Commodore Eric Young, uh, DGMP, for the floor's yours, sir. Yeah, sorry, 12, so thanks for that. Uh, Jetta. Um, really quickly, just to finish off what Speedy said then, um, just to reinforce, we are listening to what you are telling us, so please keep challenging us, challenge, challenge us um, to do better on recruiting, challenge us to do better on retention. Uh, my commitment to everyone is that we will, we will capture everything that you put in. When you look at the retention campaign, everything you put in will be in there somewhere. Um, what I can't do is do everything at once. So we will tell you what we're doing, we'll sequence it, we'll try and get the highest priority things out there first. What we can't do we will escalate into Defence People Group uh, or to, um, Cheryl was talking about, the R2-T2, the Recruiting and Retention Tiger Team. So there's two two-stars, an Army two-star and a Navy two-star who have been put in charge of looking at recruiting initiatives and retention initiatives, really around our employee value proposition, the thing that keeps us in service and taking those to an incoming government post 21st of May. So we will do things in our control. Those things that aren't in our control we're not going to throw away, we're going to push and we're going to challenge our defence senior leadership to challenge our incoming government to do those things for you. So again, thank you for your input so far and please stay engaged. Thanks very much, sir. Uh, team, that uh, now puts us on to lunch. I'm very aware of the time. I'd like everybody to put their hands together for our six uh, command warrants of dear Charlies. If there are any questions that you didn't get answered and you, you think back on after we leave, then please uh, get in contact with uh, one of them. Maybe not Cheryl, um, but uh, we are very keen to uh, understand what those questions are and if we can help them out. Uh, the last thing I'd like to say is it's great to see a sea of white. It's very nice to see our international guests and I hope that you're getting something out of this week. So thank you for giving us the opportunity to engage with you. But this doesn't happen overnight. Uh, this is a lot of, uh, a lot of planning has gone into this and I know that uh, she must have a chat with me afterwards, but uh, uh, from us, I'd like to put our hands together for Juan and her PO for making this event happen. So if you can do that, thanks very much. <laughs> Great effort. Look forward to uh, seeing you through lunch. Uh, thanks very much.